Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners, and thanks so very much for listening. A really important conversation today, David, with our friend Dr. Joseph Ellis um, of Vermont uh, and also Massachusetts about the twin legacy of Jefferson with respect to race. On the one hand, all men are created equal, and on the other, his really, his status as an apartheidist. And I want to say this much. I love Joe Ellis. I know you do too, and he's been an enormous gift to this program. I think he's more pessimistic, uh, certainly more pessimistic than you and I are. And I and I just want to say, frankly, I think maybe a little too pessimistic about this question. I think that um, you know, we've come a long, long, long way. There's a long way to go. But I don't think that the jury is still out on whether we can be a biracial republic. The jury is, can we come to terms with the fact that we now inevitably are a biracial republic? And these little gems that pop out of uh, Professor Ellis's mouth, uh, the one that just got me is that uh, he he referred to as Jefferson as a person was, quote, extraordinarily intoxicating. And I thought that was just a great line. Of course. You know, every time one becomes disillusioned with Jefferson, as we all do, then you read something about some invention or some great letter that he wrote to Edward Jenner or some... A whimsical idea he had about rebuilding Monticello or some principled view he had about library classification or whatever it might be. And you just think he's a genius. He's he's our Da Vinci. He's this great fundamental creative genius at the center of the founding, more even than Benjamin Franklin. And so then you sort of get, you fall in love with Jefferson all over again because of this capacity that he had that, that nobody else in the founding fathers, not even Benjamin Franklin had. And then suddenly it's like the record. And you realize, oh yeah, but when Edward Coles wrote to him in 1814 suggesting that Jefferson take a leading role in an emancipation movement for the Ohio Valley, Jefferson turns him down and not only turns him down, but says it's a bad idea. Then you then you get caught up short again. And so this is this is the roller coaster that it is to love and admire Thomas Jefferson, but to realize that he uh, had some some impulses and some views that are very, very hard for us to understand and assimilate in our time. Let's go to the show. Before we do, I was going to give you an opportunity to talk about your online constitution course, but my goodness, you are just being bombarded with requests from folks. You're going to have to do a third one. Well, the first one is, is in its last two weeks, we'll be meeting on Saturday. It's been extraordinarily fruitful. And one of the best conversations about these questions that I've ever been involved with. I'm going to repeat it in late January and February, and there will be two, maybe three sections. So as many people as want to do this can, I'm going to change the curriculum a little bit. But this week, for example, David, we're talking about amendments and everyone is coming with a list of the amendments they think we're going to need if we're going to right. go on. Uh, and then the last week is, is called, Are We Rome? And we're talking about whether we're going the dreary sad path of the Roman Republic. It's it's great stuff, and I urge people to do it. We also have a few places still for the January retreats at Locksaw Lodge, and then there are the summer programs of Lewis and Clark. So lots. Just go to jeffersonhour.com. And I believe that the information about the Constitution course at the end of January is now up, and people can begin to sign up for it. Very shortly, we're going to have another Zoom call for the Thomas Jefferson Hour and you can go to jeffersonhour.com, find out about that. And you can also support the show at jeffersonhour.com by clicking on Donate, joining the 1776 Club, or however you wish to. We so need it, and we so appreciate it. And they can buy my new book, Donald Trump and the Death of American Integrity, An Autopsy and a Path Forward. I'm proud of this book. I'm glad that I wrote it. I think it's more important now than it was on November 3rd. And so Joe I Joe read people, it and had to had to talk to you a bit about it off off mic during our conversation this week. I'm delighted by that and I appreciate it. Uh, and anyway, people can find that on Kindle and Amazon and much much more, but consider signing up now for the Constitution course before the sections in the spring get filled up. And David, thank you. These are very difficult but important, I think, conversations. And I'm so aware of what somebody just driving a car somewhere or, or, or turning on their home uh, podcast might hear. And I want to make sure people understand that we don't in any way endorse the views of Jefferson or anyone else from the 18th century on questions of race, but we explore them because it's essential that we do. A key to much better understanding. And with that, shall we go to the show, sir? 
Thank you, Citizen, and thank you, everyone, for following the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson and American history. This week, we are joined by the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson, and our returning undisputed champion, (laughs) Professor Joseph Ellis. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this post-election conversation with the eminent American historian of the early national period, Dr. Joseph Ellis. Uh, You all know his credentials. Uh, He's published uh, more than a dozen books. He's won all of the great awards, uh, and he's been a real friend to me, to David, and to this program, uh, especially because of the enforced sheltering at home of the pandemic. And we're glad to have him back. Joe, I want to welcome you. And I hope today that we can talk about an essay you recently published about the two legacies of Thomas Jefferson. Sure. Um, We want to make sure we filter it through our understanding of what Jefferson's legacy means. And the piece I've written is called The Dual Legacy of Thomas Jefferson. And it really says that there are two sides to the man. The one side we know best, and for good reason, is that he wrote the magic words of American history. The ones that begin, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These, I would argue, are the magic words of American history and the foundation for the liberal tradition which Uh, The meaning of those words has expanded over the subsequent two centuries to include not just white males with property, but women, African Americans, racial minorities, uh, gays and lesbians. Um, and, uh, And that's the tradition and the legacy that is the basis for the civil rights movement. Uh, Martin Luther King, when he gave his I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, said, I have come to collect on a promissory note by Thomas Jefferson. But there's another side to the Jefferson legacy. Um, And in his autobiography, uh, this is the way he put it. It's the less attractive side, but it's the one that we need to come to terms with. Um, He says... While we know for sure that these people, meaning African Americans who are enslaved, must be free, we also know that once free, they cannot live in this society with us, that too much history and nature itself has made it impossible for blacks and whites to live together in the same society. And in fact, in Jefferson's life, towards the end especially, he kept saying that he couldn't lead the project towards emancipation because We couldn't free blacks until we knew where we were going to send them, somewhere outside the United States. And I think that one of the implications of that is that that I I want us to talk about is what percentage of the American people believes in the first half and what percentage believes in the second half. Yeah, 200 years after the fact. Let me go back for a moment, Joe. So that first side of Jefferson, the glorious side, I mean, there have been two giants in American history who have gone back to that language at essential, even critical times. The first was Abraham Lincoln in the late 1850s when he went back to the Declaration of Independence and he said, look, we don't know what Jefferson meant exactly, but whatever he himself meant, we can't go on unless we read that statement in the broadest possible terms. So when he said all men are created equal, we have to assume that's every human being, black or white, and that this is not a historically contingent statement. This is a universal statement, and it's essential that we acknowledge that if we wish to continue. And then a hundred years later, Martin Luther King on the mall, as you say, in 1963, in the I Have a Dream speech, creates this somewhat elaborate trope or metaphor and says, That was a promissory note, and every time we black people have brought that promissory note to the Bank of American Justice, it has been returned for insufficient funds again and again and again. And he says, now we're bringing it back to the Bank 
of American justice, and this time you are going to cash the check. So those two moments, Joe, are extraordinarily important because not only do they take their inspiration from Jefferson's Enlightenment preamble, but they also, in some sense, rescue Jefferson from his own other side, don't they? I agree with much of what you said, but there's one important disagreement between us, and I think we ought to have this argument for the listeners. I think Lincoln understood Jefferson's language to mean that slavery was incompatible with the values of the American Revolution. And that that was incontestable, and that the fact that it had lingered, more than lingered, had grown since the Revolution into the institution that it was, was a violation of the principles of 76. But I don't think that Lincoln interpreted those words to mean that blacks and whites were equals in the society once they were freed. In fact, Lincoln himself called in a group of black leaders during the Civil War to tell them that they needed to get ready to move elsewhere once we won the war. This was after Gettysburg. And he sent a commission of five members of his administration to Panama to explore Panama as a possible location for a portion of that great migration. Now, he was assassinated before any of these things could happen, so we can't be sure what what Lincoln would have done. But I think that King represents a fundamental expansion of Jefferson's promise to mean not just that slavery was wrong, but that racial inequality was wrong, embedded, structured, legalized racial inequality. And I see, as a historian... I want to call attention to the recentness of that commitment on our part. We as a people have not been committed to the creation of what we would now call a multiracial society since the middle of the 20th century. And there were significant portions of the populace. Most of the states of the former Confederacy never accepted the Voting Rights Act and the implications of that. And I think that we're trying to do something that is extremely hard to do, to create a genuinely multiracial society in which equality was not just presumed, but embedded. I actually do agree with you because Lincoln proposed his own, what would have been 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. In one of them, he said that Southern states would be compensated if they freed their own slaves by themselves by the year 1900. In another one, he provided incentives for freedmen, freed blacks and whites, to leave the country and go to Liberia or some other location yet to be determined. And so Lincoln, if Lincoln had gotten his 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments before the war, uh, it would have been a very different country from the one that emerged after the war. And Lincoln was not prepared to go as far as the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments that were actually promulgated in 1865 through 1868. And so in some weird and ironic sense, if the South, if the Confederacy had accepted Lincoln's leadership, they would have been able to perpetuate slavery for at least another half century. I agree. Although I don't think, I mean, we know they weren't prepared to do that. I mean, the war started because they fired the first shot at Sumter, uh, because the issue then was whether it could be extended into the territories. And they believed that once you let that go, that was the end of the ball game for them. Um, I think, again, though, I'm calling attention to something that we up here at 2020, I mean, Baldwin, James Baldwin said it in um, Notes of a Native Son. He said, we, we all agree that it's very hard to establish a democracy in a country this, this big and diverse, but it's much harder to, do, to establish a democracy that folds what he said, black men, he must now have met black men and women, into that democracy. FDR never tried to do it. Uh, it, 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 you know, the, the the liberal leaders of the 19th and 20th century, to include Lincoln, never tried to do this. And when uh, Johnson in 1964 was trying to pass the Voting Rights Act, Richard Rus- Russell, senator from Georgia, told him, Lyndon, if you do this, the Democratic Party will lose the South for 30 years. Well, that was 50 years ago. And this is the base of the Republican Party and the Southern strategy. I'm saying that race is the 
is this pool beneath the surface of American society that's never going to go away. It's like cancer. We can make great improvements, and we, we have and will continue to do so. But that, to me, Jefferson is the most resonant figure in American history, R-E-S-O-N-A-N-T, because he stands astride the two greatest uh, sides of this, the, both sides of this issue. He's the most eloquent spokesman for equality, and yet he's also the most eloquent sp- spokesman for white supremacy. Jefferson felt, number one, that they could be freed and emancipated, but they would always be black, and that this somehow was going to create a fundamental distinction between us and the other that would uh, continue permanently, or at least for a long, long time in American history. And his second reason was... Let me stop you there, because and, and cause I want to put a, put a kind of asterisk around that. Jefferson was pre-Darwin and pre-Mendel. And the fact that he was pre-Mendel meant that he didn't understand genes. And as a result, Jefferson thought that it was entirely possible that if Africans came to the United States and lived here long enough, over time, they would turn white. And notice the only slaves Jefferson ever freed were people from the Hemming side of the family who looked white. You could be free if you were white or you looked white. Um, Seven-eighths usually was his measuring stick there. His belief that color was crucial, as you say, but he, he was... Um, he thought that history over time might change that. Yeah, but it wasn't, you know, there were two ways that that might change, Joe. One was the sort of Montesquieu way, the environmentalism as it was known at the time, that that right. Africans being in, in a northern temperate climate might suddenly move towards white pigmentation. Um, mm-hmm. That was what you're talking about. But he also understood that if white people and black people intermingled, that after X number of generations, the blackness was washed away. He said he abhorred that idea of miscegenation, but of course we know he was himself a miscegenationist. Gentlemen, we need to take just a short break. We'll return to this conversation in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. This week, we're having a conversation with the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson and Professor Joseph Ellis. I have to tell the both of you, listening to the first part of this conversation, I am quite disturbed. Just tell me, gentlemen, that there's a happy ending to this conversation. I we're talking about those immortal words of Jefferson's that we hold these truths to be self-evident. And I don't want to get so depressed by this that we're, we're just going to give up. You know, I'd like to think that America's made great, great strides in the 200 years. It has. It has. I mean, and, you know, and King said that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice, a phrase he got from a 19th century theologian, Theodore Parker. And to some extent, looking at this history of race over the last 50 years. That's certainly true. What I'm saying, though, is that every time it takes a step forward, it takes a half a step backward, and that we have to know what we're up against. This is tough. What we're trying to do is extremely difficult. If you go into battle, you've got to know what you're fighting, and you're fighting 300 or more years of racism and portions of the society that have never accepted the central principles of the civil rights movement. I don't think that's pessimistic. I think it's realistic. Let me jump in here um, to say a couple of things. First of all, to our listeners, you know, we're talking about some really um, difficult things here. And some of the things we're talking about um, uh, are appalling to even think about. You know, the Jefferson's theories of genetics and race, for example, and the idea that environment would whiten the pigmentation of Africans and so on. Uh, we apologize in advance to anyone who is upset by this kind of talk. Historians have to talk about these things. It's very hard to talk about them with sufficient sensitivity to these issues. And so we're we're, we're being very careful here, but we're also being candid about the way 
um, American history, especially in the age of Jefferson, looked at these questions. You know, David, you said, are they segregationists? Yes, Jefferson is an apartheidist, and so frankly is Lincoln. But Lincoln grew. Yeah, and grew. The, Link, yeah, and the Lincoln-Douglas debates, Douglas accused him of being uh, a non-segregationist. But you were talking about, you know, white privilege, and 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 this very conversation is an example of that. It's three white guys talking about race. Well, we're stuck there, but I want to go back to another couple of points here. Um, so I do believe Lincoln grew over time, and that his, his attitudes um, softened on this question, and he realized as the war went on that certain things were going to become um, inevitable if the country was going to continue as a republic. I also am more optimistic than I think Joe is. I think we have not only come a long, long, long way, but we will continue to move forward. And what's happened, I think, in the last, um, since Barack Obama was elected president, is I think that it aroused what's left of deep race anxiety and indeed overt racism in parts of the American people. And they it came screaming out by way of a kind of Newtonian reaction to the election of this gifted African-American. And it's, it's going to play itself out. And I think these reactions are inevitable as we make these strides forward, that there are people that just can't stay on that path and therefore they have to jump off. And, the, and then when a, a demagogue or two come along to encourage them, uh, then they feel licensed to express things that exist in lots of people, but for most people, they're um, held in check or, or, or they're qualified with doubt or, or with, with a more open mind. And so I do believe we're making great strides. There's a long, long way to go. But if you look at the average condition of African Americans in 2020 and compare it even to 1968, there's a lot of good news here now, but the question is, and here's where I go back to Joe and Jefferson. So Jefferson not only said that um, there was a fundamental problem in slavery because slaves are black, that will be an eternal badge, a distinct. He calls it a distinction which nature has made. But he also says this, and now we're getting into even more difficult territory. Joe, he believed, to the best of his analysis, that for whatever reason. Black people were, in some respects, inferior to their white counterparts. And in that famous dissertation on race in Notes on Virginia, he said that they can't do math, that they can make verse, but they can't make poetry, that they lack enterprise, and so on. So this long, ugly, racist, pseudo-scientific discussion of what it is to be black, what it is to be an African, is right at the center of Jefferson's work. And here's my question for you. Did he believe it? Did he really believe it? Or was he in some sense creating an infrastructure of defense and justification for the outrage of owning people? I think he really believed it, and he wasn't that unusual. Um, although the progressive position at that moment was the Enlightenment position that blacks were perceived as inferior because we only saw them as slaves. Right. And, and that slavery was the source of that apparent inferiority that once freed, that would not be true. That was the position of people like Benjamin Rush, um, who was one of his good friends. And Franklin. And Franklin's position, too. And Hamilton's position and John Jay's position. How about John Adams? Yeah, Adam, that would be his position, too. Um, I mean, but he, he was, he's removed from this because he doesn't own any slaves. But both Adams and Jefferson underline their views on this is something that needs to be mentioned, and that is that there was a political dimension to this thought process, and especially true for Jefferson, and events proved him right. If we face this issue squarely, and we attempt to end slavery and integrate African Americans into the populace, it is certain we will launch a civil war, and that will be the bloodiest war in American history. But he saw it as a race war, not a war between white Southerners and white and Northerners. He described it as a race war, and, and he said all whites need, uh, south of the Ohio River need to evacuate if that so happens. He, so he was wrong. They're both discussing the race and slavery issue in a context, a pre-Civil War context, in which both of them are terrified at the political consequences of attempting to address this issue frontally. But the great irony, Joe, is that it didn't come to race war. In fact, 
after the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment, so far from being black reprisals against our former white masters, it was the opposite. That's when the black codes and the KKK and the lynchings and the systematic torture and re-enslavement by other terms of black people occurred. And that wasn't their doing. That was the doing of their former masters, the white Southerners. And so the race wars that Jefferson and to a certain degree Adams predicted never came. That's true. But but what did come was, in some ways, the, the, the United States was more racist in the post-Civil War years and into the 19th century than it was during slavery. Because enslavement meant you didn't have to worry about them because you had total control. The level of outright racism, you know, the lynchings and the Klan terrorism. Uh, now, listen, this is a Southerner speaking, born and raised in Virginia, went to William & Mary, married to a woman from Mississippi now. But that I think that most of the residents of the former Confederacy, certainly from Reconstruction on up through most of the 20th century, never accepted the principles of Brown versus Board of Education. Well, first of all, they didn't accept the principles of of the uh, 14th and 15th Amendment because they were disenfranchised. They weren't allowed to vote on that. Remember, Reconstruction knocked out anybody that served in the Confederacy. And they reviewed the Supreme Court decision in 54, uh, the Brown versus Board of Education, as the imposition by a bunch of white guys that were not elected on them. And they attempted to oppose that by setting up uh, private schools that were going to evade the integration issue. And as soon as the civil rights, the law, the voting rocks came in, they attempted to find as many ways as possible to disenfranchise blacks with poll taxes and everything else. So that the hostility to the principle of racial equality is deeply embedded. Joe, let me take it back to uh, to Jefferson for a moment. If if Jefferson could magically leave his grave at Monticello in 2020 and appear in Charlottesville and appear in New York and appear in New Orleans and appear in Detroit and appear in Denver and San Francisco and Portland and Seattle and appear in Boston and Philadelphia, what would his response be? Would he say, I told you so? Or would he say, you know, you're doing pretty well, considering? Let me read the, let me read the last paragraph of uh, Joe's column to answer that. He writes, as for Jefferson's advice from the hereafter, unfortunately, he is busy being dead. My best guess is that he would say we are on our own, though he knows that his magic words have won every major battle in American history. This one, however, is the most challenging and decisive battle of all. Mm. Hey, that sounds good to me. Who wrote that? That's wonderful. And, yeah, yeah, you yeah, wrote um, that, Joe. <laughs> um, I, I think that the generational sovereignty issue that I'm talking about there uh, elliptically, Clay understands this as well or better than I do, but that he really would say, look, I, and if you did bring them to life and put them in a time machine, he would say, you need to figure this out yourself. I mean, I, I've done the best I could in my time. Every generation has to, has, is sovereign over its own fate. Um, I do think, I mean, if you, if you tried to, you know, school him and tell him all that's happened, I got to believe he'd side with the magic words. Um, that's what he put on his gravesite as the first thing. He didn't put president. He didn't put the Louisiana Purchase, but he put those the magic. He put the you know, author of the Declaration of Independence. That's what he knew was his ticket to the, the hereafter, to the posterity's judgment. And so, I think, you know, you know, you were you were speculating, you know, wildly here. But the answer to your question is, I would think say that, of course, these people have a right to vote. And those votes cannot be taken away from them. I think he would say we're doing pretty well, frankly. I know that he would not be unaware of the problems. But if you turn on the top, let's say, top eight or nine cable television programs and look at the commentator class, a very large number of African Americans of extraordinary capacity with the deepest insights, having achieved eminence in their universities, in foundations, in government, uh, I think he would say, wow, um, that whatever concerns I, Jefferson, had in, in, in 1781 when I wrote Notes on Virginia have effectively been silenced by the achievement of African Americans in the 21st century. And if it's that good now, it can only get 
better later. And I would, I think he would say that the average life of, of free African Americans in the 21st century is on the road to something like the possibility that we might just be able to be a biracial republic. Do you think that's Pollyanna? Uh, not quite. Um, and I, and I think that to support it, I would cite the language he used in that section of the notes in Virginia, where he uses this phrase. I know you know it, but maybe the readers don't. He said, he he, par- he preceded his comments about black inferiority, natural inherent um, inferiority, with with the phrase, "I have a suspicion only." I advance it as a suspicion only. He said, "Right." So that he's not saying this is a self-evident truth, um, as equality is. Um, uh, but I think that, um, you know, it's a classic, you know, is the glass half full or half empty? I think it's half full, but for it to get full, understand what we are up against and recognize that we're attempting to do something that is extremely difficult and it was going to move forward at an incremental pace. And each time it moves in a big way, uh, like electing a black person to president, we should expect a backlash. But why is that? What is it about us as a species that we can look at, at, at a person of a, a different color or race than our own and feel threatened by it? Is that unique to us white guys or is it... Is it every race? What? Why is that? That that we can't, you know, like Rodney King, just get along? Oh boy, um, that's a. I think that it's not unique to us. Japanese have feelings towards people unlike them. The Chinese don't like the Muslim population in the western part of their their country. I think that nationalist movements throughout Europe and the world over the recent 10 years have shown a prejudice against immigrants um, that's pretty powerful. So that's slightly different from what you're talking about because African Americans as a group can trace their ancestry further back in the United States than the total white population. Because like my people, they came from Ireland in the middle of the 19th century. The height of the African American migration was, believe it or not, 1776. So it's not that they are newcomers. People that have studied race and racism said that there's no scientific basis for the concept of racism, but it's more psychological and sociological as people need to blame others for their own inadequacies. Uh, this is where you need uh, you know, to go pretty deep in ways that I'm not qualified to do. Um, so it's tribal, you're saying? Yep, it's tribal. And it's um, it's potent. It's 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 a way of identifying with other people like you, who agree that these other people are um, not like you, and um, uh, and and are historically people that we've been able to think of as below us. And once they claim that they are equal with us, or some of them seem to be above us, it's a perversion of the natural order in their view. It's not supposed to happen. It's not the America I want to be in. I want to go back to a place where that wasn't true. And, he, and, um, and that's a power. Apparently, um, 72 million people voted for Donald Trump. Now, again, not all of them were doing so on this issue, but a significant number of people were. I, I see it so much uh, more optimistically, I guess, than all of this. I think there obviously there there is a if you look if you're a white person and and you see a black person for the first time you're suddenly aware of of the other just as if you're a, a a person from who speaks english and you encounter somebody from norway and you hear that person speaking norwegian you realize you're in the presence of an other at least linguistically and but so there obviously there obviously these core uh, observational uh, distinctions that are made because all of us are Aristotelians. We all want to slice male versus female, adult versus child, American versus Mexican, and so on. 
Th these are inevitable ways in which the, the, the neurons of our brains operate, but most racism is constructed. And so if you could have a some kind of a surveillance into every family below the Mason-Dixon line in 1940, 1950, 1960, every 10 years, and listen to the family conversations around the table and around the television set, I think you would find that racism is constructed from parent to child and from child to to grandchild, and that much of this is completely uh, an artifice, uh, but it is based upon some ancient understandings of tribalism. Uh, it just seems to me that, that enlightenment can overcome this. It may not ever overcome it 100%, but I think it can overcome this to a very large degree. And I think the emergence of a widespread black middle class and professional class has changed this dramatically because the average person, whether they're bigoted or not, in turning on the television any time now, sees African Americans doing remarkable things. And not just in music and sports, but in uh, medicine and in the law and in political theory and in English literature and so on. And I think that really has an effect but the problem the, where this breaks down is, is, the, is the reconstruction of racism family by family. And, and that's gonna take a lot longer because you can't, of course, break up those families and you can't intrude upon their privacy. But if you heard the discussions that were actually going on, say, on the night of Barack Obama's victory in 2008, I'm thinking that most of us would faint dead away. This is an uncomfortable conversation, gentlemen, and I thank you both for it. Right now, we need to take a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this special edition of The Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm Clay Jenkinson, out of character. David Swenson is, as usual, the semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, and our friend Joseph Ellis, today in Vermont, is discussing with us the twin legacy of Thomas Jefferson. Um, and Joe, let me ask you this question. You say you're a Southerner and you went to William and Mary. I, I graduated from college in 1977, but from a great Midwestern university, the University of Minnesota. My first year was at Vanderbilt. And when I was at Vanderbilt in 1973, um, there were only nine black students in that university. Think of that. Uh, thousands of white people, nine African-American students. Talk about what it was like at William & Mary when you matriculated. I'm a bit older than you, Clay. I matriculated in 65, but the civil rights movement was going on and we had not the vaguest idea that that was happening. William & Mary is a very good school and it attracts the best people in Virginia and outside of Virginia, too. Well, not the best. That's UVA, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, I went back for my 50th reunion and was asked to give a talk about the class and the, the world that we lived in, and I played some music and stuff, but I said, you know, we were really oblivious. There was not a single black student at William & Mary. The president of the College of William & Mary had formerly been head of the Department of Education for the Commonwealth of Virginia, and his major achievement was to create a privatized system that allowed whites to not have to go to school with blacks. And um, In other words, after Brown v. Board of Education, he was one of the many school superintendents in the South who created private white schools to avoid integration. Right. So we were oblivious. There was a black school down the road, Hampton, and I, I remember going down there once just to, you know, check it out and um, talk to people, and they were all into the civil rights movement. It makes your point, though, Clay, that the, between then and now, William Mary is fully integrated. It, it makes your point, the distance we've traveled between then and now is enormous, and I don't want to play down that. But I think that what I'm saying to you is that as we move forward along this arc of the moral universe, we're going to have major steps forward, but that we have to be aware of the fact that this will generate a backlash because a certain percentage of the population, I don't want to put a number on it because I would be I'm just guessing. I don't want to be utopian, but I don't want to be pessimistic. I want to be realistically optimistic. And uh, we're moving forward. And I believe that that side of Jefferson would be the one that would side with us without question. Um, 
but he, in some senses, warned us about the other side. But what Jefferson shows us, Joe, is that access and education are the great cultural healers that when we integrated the schools, when p places like William and Mary and Yale and Harvard decided that they were not only going to admit African-American students, but they were going to recruit them and they were going to nurture uh, a somewhat larger um, class of African-Americans and other minorities than, 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 than they really could uh, sustain from a point of view of, of white backlash, they change the nature of the thing. And every time you go into a class or go into a, a clinic or go to see a judge or a lawyer or see a black pundit on television or see a black president and now an African-American vice president, that, that opens doors of inspiration and possibility for the future, and it, I think it grows not ge not arithmetically, not mathematically, but geometrically. And we're going to see in the 21st century a huge explosion of black achievement because of access and education. I agree, but here's where you you know you love Jefferson more than anybody else. You know who I love more than anybody else <laughs> back there is Adams. And this is a kind of dialogue that Adams and Jefferson would have had, in some ways did have, in their twilight years. It's about the future and about whether we should be optimistic or we should be cautious. And um, I'm on the cautious side. Yeah, and I think you're an Adamsite. And, and, and so, but David Swenson, you're sort of often between us. Where are you in this conversation? Well, we're, we're talking almost exclusively about African Americans in regard to racism, and they are not the only ones. Now, by the way, Jefferson did not think about Native Americans the same way he thought about Africa. He believed that Native Americans could be integrated into the society. He didn't have the same racial prejudice towards Native Americans or the indigenous people as he did towards African Americans. Yeah, it reminds me of Daniel Borston's great essay, Red, White, and Black, but David, go on. Well, what, what I'm hearing from both of you is that um, it's a pretty grim situation, but I'm also hearing optimism from both of you, uh, more from you, Clay, as a Jeffersonian, and a little bit more guarded from you, Joe, as an Adamsite. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. I remain optimistic. Um, we all grew up in an era, you talked about the civil rights movement in the 60s, and I remember that uh, as a you know ten twelve year old and and seeing these things and living in a out in the middle of nowhere in a small town in North Dakota and watching the black and white TVs as 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 this stuff uh, developed and uh, if you look at what has happened just during our lifetimes, uh, it, it's pretty amazing. It's uh, human beings accepting differences in others and learning to live with it, whether you like it or not. Joe, per Jefferson again, he owns as many as 600 other human beings. He buys and sells people while serving as the president of the United States through agents and so on. So Jefferson has to live with this. And here's the thing I've been searching for all of my career in thinking about Jefferson. Where's the psychological fallout? If you say all men are created equal and you are buying and selling them too, this is going to, Freud's going to say, this is going to produce neurosis. This is going to produce uh, illness that you, you can't live with this whopping contradiction without it having, um, it expressing itself in some form of neurotic behavior. Where, where's the fallout in Jefferson? I don't think Jefferson was neurotic about this. I mean, I think you can diagnose it and say he should have been. But there's no evidence that he was. I, you know, I wrote a book about him called American Sphinx, in which I talk about there's two tracks inside Jefferson that, that uh, don't seem to converse with one another. And um, he can levitate out of these kind of situations in his own mind. Now you're channeling your inner Paige Smith here. You know, Paige Smith, the great historian, believed that Monticello was an illusion. It was a kind of a, an optical illusion designed to look like a Palladian uh, one-story villa and to hide all of the facts of slavery as much as possible, not only from the public, but from Jefferson himself. And he went so far as to say the dumb waiters and all of the gimcracks that Jefferson designed were designed to allow him to pretend, at least at times, that he was not a significant slaveholder. Right. I mean, he and he also, what he convinced himself was that he was doing the right thing morally because 
if you freed these people without any place to send them, they, you de- they, horrible things would happen to them. And until you know where you can send them, like back to Africa or someplace in the Caribbean, you, the best thing you can do is be a very, very uh, paternalistic um, master and take care of them and see that they're your family. He talks about them as my family. Well, some of them really were his family. Um, uh, and he really believed in his, you know, in that, that he was doing the right thing by not freeing them and being a responsible. And one of the things he said, he would never sell them without their consent. Um, he would never break up families. And during his lifetime, he kept that promise. After he died, however, the, the 121 slaves were sold um, and families were broken up. So two two questions as we kind of wind down here, Joe. They're both impossible questions. My one, favorite kind, yes. Uh, number one, how can Jefferson survive this now that we're so aware in a way that you weren't when you went to William and Mary back then in the late 60s? Uh, there's been a sea change in Jefferson's studies, and as you know now, race is the center of all discussion of Jefferson, and it looks pretty bad. It looks pretty bad on a number of fronts, the, the pseudoscientific racist tract in Notes on Virginia, the miscegenation, the Sally Hemings story, uh, the, a lot of other things. Um, at times, he's been accused of even breeding slaves for market. How does Jefferson survive this uh, awakening in the American people of how bad his profile really is on race questions? Well, it's what you said is true. Once, since the civil rights movement, once the race issue becomes the central window through which to view Jefferson, his stock was uh, fated to go down. I mean, my take is okay, um, and that's that's inevitable and unavoidable. But he also wrote the magic words. He also is more responsible for the separation of church and state in the United States than anybody else. He made the greatest executive decision in American history by purchasing Louisiana. Um, and if you read his letters, he's a man of, who's interesting as a human being in a way that is extraordinarily intoxicating. Um, and, it, and finally, we need to get used to the notion that all of these men, Jefferson, Washington, Adams, Hamilton, were flawed human beings like us. Some more than others. Some more than others but that, that none of these people were icons in the way that they appear on Mount Rushmore or even on the mall. And that, in fact, if they really were perfect, why would we study them? We have nothing to learn from them. Well, They're gods, you know, they, you know, we're not gods. My projects as a writer on the founding is to recover the founders, not as saints, not as canonized saints, but as imperfect human beings. And because I really began with Adams, that was quite natural because he's so visibly and self, uh, self-assertedly an imperfect human being. Well, Jefferson's in the same category. Um, I don't think we should be tearing down any, the Jefferson Memorial tomorrow. I don't think anybody wants to take his face off Mount Rushmore. But we need to learn with, to live with Jefferson the man and recognize what he has to contribute and what, in other respects, he teaches us that is less attractive. All right, second question. Um, hard, hard question, but I think I know the answer. The postmodernists would say that you're being very, much too charitable to Jefferson, and the fact that he uh, said all men are created equal and the other things that he said that are so marvelously high-minded and exemplary of the Enlightenment are essentially meaningless statements because behind them there was a typical white racist man of privilege using power in very traditional ways, not really meaning those things in the fullest sense of the term, and therefore their value as statements is not only compromised but maybe fatally compromised by the fact that he couldn't even barely live up to those high-minded pronouncements. What do you say to the postmodernist critique of Jefferson and the Enlightenment, that it was a charade of words? Uh, I think that it was a, a setting of a very high standard for what America could become and for what the world, in Jefferson's view, would become that represents an ideal that we always need to keep moving towards, all the while knowing we'll never completely reach it. 
but by groving towards it, he gives us a goal. And whatever he thought the words meant, we know what we believe the words to mean. And um, and he would say, yes, you, it's your interpretation of those words for your time that should count. So he gives us um, a goal line to move towards, knowing that it's going to continually recede before us. So the ideals in your mind are not discredited. They might discredit Jefferson the man, but they don't discredit those ideals. That is right. So, Joe, uh, you've come a long way in the course of your own career. You were never a Southerner in the sense that we both know some historians who were, who um, who who were uh, up unhappy by Brown v. Board of Education, who who liked the privatization of the school systems of the South, who had uh, real concerns about the capacity of white people and black people to live together, and who resisted the civil rights movement, sometimes with extraordinary success. We both know such people. You were never one of them. How do you... Um, account for the fact that you didn't get sucked into the post-Brown miasma? Well, when I went to Yale to graduate school after the College of William and Mary, my mentor initially was a Southerner named C. Van Woodward. And C. Van Woodward was the leading Southern liberal of the day. And I took course on the civil rights movement on um, Jim Crow from him. And so the influences that that I experienced only reinforced the notion that the future lay with integration and with the acceptance of racial equality. And um, the people I associated with um, were not people who thought that the that Jim Crow and the return to that was in any way a good idea. Um, so maybe it's only luck. Um, uh, I don't know what would have happened if I'd stayed in the South. I think I think a lot of the academic programs, certainly places like UVA and um, um, Vanderbilt and um, uh, Southern Methodist and University yep. of Texas, those all those places were filled with people who saw the civil rights movement as a step forward, not a step backward. So you're saying, I think, that Jefferson was right after all, that education is the great yeast of enlightenment. I believe that, and I think that, um, I really think that one of the lessons I'm carrying from the most recent election is we need a, you've heard me say this before, but I repeat it for our listeners, that is, I would like legislation passed by the states to require every graduate from high school to pass the same civics test that uh, immigrants must pass for citizenship in the United States. The lack of understanding that is out there makes a good portion of the American citizenry vulnerable to misinformation because they have no foundation on which uh, to make judgments of their own. Um, and this is a failure on our part and, and in middle school, high school, and college education that I think we need to begin to think about. Agreed, sir. And that seems an appropriate place to bring this conversation to a close. I thank both of you gentlemen for a difficult but necessary conversation this week on the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I want to thank David Swenson and uh, Dr. Joseph Ellis for this conversation. Again, I repeat, these are uncomfortable things to talk about. And at times we have to invoke arguments from the 18th century, which are very hard for the 21st century to stomach or even to understand. But it's essential that we turn to face the past and face the legacy of the past, which we continue to bear in the 21st century, or we can't possibly find our way out of this morass. So I am most appreciative of Joe Ellis. Um, we're working from his most recent op-ed piece about the twin legacy of Thomas Jefferson. And as you say, Joe, Jefferson embodies the paradoxes of American life, and therefore he is, in some respects, the indispensable man because we need that, um, that paradox as grounded in the Founding Fathers, but most particularly in Jefferson to try to understand who we are and how we got here and where we might be headed. So we'll see you all next week for another exciting and important edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. 
The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson. <laughs>